A warm welcome to this week's edition of Energy Frontiers. I am Justina Okechukwu. This show has been proudly brought to you with support from African Energy Chamber. These are headline energy news for you from across Africa and around the world. The London Brent crude and the U.S. West Texas Intermediate gained about 5% in the week ended April 6th, a third straight week of increase after the organization of the petroleum exporting countries and its allies, including Russia, pledged voluntary production cuts of 1.16 million barrels a day and a U.S. crude inventory decline. Oil prices jumped started to moderate lower on Thursday as weak U.S. economic data raised concerns over a potential global recession and demand reduction. Reacting to this development, a global investment bank, Goldman Sachs, said that the upcoming crude oil production cost by OPEC could result in a significantly larger deficit in the market and estimates that the cost will raise OPEC plus revenues as the boost to prices more than offsets the drop in volumes. Goldman raised its price forecast for Brent by $5 to $95 a barrel for December 2023. The bank sees the London Brent crude for 2024 at $100 a barrel, up from an earlier projection of $97. The Secretary General and CEO of London based World Energy Council, Angela Wilkinson, says to get renewables to scale, other clean energy friends has to be in the mix and multiple clean energy bridges has to be built. Her comments come after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently published a major report stressing the need for the world to urgently scale up climate action. Australian listed EMP company BW Energy says it has completed drilling operations on the first production well of the hibiscus Ruche Phase 1 well located offshore Gabon. The company says it now expects to see first oil extracted from the well later this month, a move that could represent a turning point for Gabon's oil sector. Pedeto Oil and Gas, based in New Jersey, has announced the award of the MOU3 well construction contract in Morocco to Skyavas Sal, also a Moroccan company. Pedeto says construction will start by Monday, while drilling activities are expected to commence before the end of May this year. The Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority and VITOL, a multinational energy and commodities company, have signed a carbon vista agreement worth $50 million, an initiative that aims to support Nigeria in meeting its net zero targets by investing in carbon avoidance and removal projects. According to Nigeria's Vice President, Professor Yemi Shibajo, Africa can become the first truly green civilization, given the continent's status as the lowest emitters of carbon. And that was a snapshot of your energy news headlines. When we return, we take a deep dive into North Africa's hydrocarbons markets and how much potential this region is unnecessary in the global energy arena. We'll be right back. This is Energy Frontiers, everyone. Now, North Africa is home to some of the world's largest oil and gas reserves, and the hydrocarbon sector plays a crucial role in the economies of countries such as Algeria, Libya, and Egypt. However, despite the decline in investment in this sector, some positive developments in countries like Egypt have seen a major shift after it announced a $19.5 billion investment plan to develop its natural gas sector back in 2020. To help us understand the factors that play in this region, I had a chat with Kobe Connelly, a senior analyst for research and advisory at Energy Intelligence, a leading global energy information company. Take a listen. Now, how strategic is North Africa's hydrocarbon sector to the global industry? Well, the countries that I spend a lot of time looking at in North Africa are the, the very same ones that you just mentioned, those being Algeria, Libya, and, and Egypt. Um, and, and right off the bat, the obvious um, you know, variable there that's extremely important is that Algeria and Libya are two 
uh, core OPEC members uh, that they each pump a, an, an upwards of a million barrels a day in crude oil. Um, and, you know, Libya is, is fairly vulnerable to uh, disruption given its, its political situation. Um, and, you know, you do see a tangible uh, market impact when production is taken offline very suddenly from a place like that. You know, it, it, Egypt has uh, two LNG export terminals on its northern coast. Um, it, it's got over just over 12 million uh, tons per year in export capacity, and it, it wants to leverage that capacity to become uh, a regional gas export hub, certainly based in North Africa, but drawing on a lot of, um, of Eastern Mediterranean gas resources as well. Um, and, and then finally, just to kind of wrap up a, a brief overview of, of where the region fits strategically, uh, both Algeria and Egypt are angling to try and become major suppliers of green hydrogen to, to European markets in the future, um, which is, is also an outcome that's, that's a ways away and certainly far from a guarantee. Um, but, but that's a brief view of, of where the region fits into the global picture. Okay, so how much of foreign investment inflows in North Africa is attracting and how has it impacted the industry's output, among other things? Um, that's a question that mainly impacts uh, Egypt and Algeria for the moment. Um, you know, Algeria did sign around $6 billion uh, worth of new production sharing agreements last year. Um, that's partially due to the fact that it, it recently did an overhaul of, of its oil and gas sector law, um, but is also certainly motivated by, by the energy crisis as well. Um, and, and it's probably worth mentioning that a lot of those agreements, uh, most of them, in fact, were signed by uh, international oil companies that uh, are already present in Algeria. So, for example, ENI of Italy or uh, Occidental Petroleum from, from the U.S. Um, but, but those new deals may improve uh, the investor confidence in, in Algeria. Um, you know, you, you've had more limited exits. BP exited last year, but it, it only had fairly minor assets there. Um, and, and then, of course, Italy, you know, is, is a, a large importer of Algerian gas. So it's its involvement there through ENI is is certainly a big driver of that in, investment. Um, Egypt has uh, two uh, two bid rounds open currently, um, only one of which focuses on on offshore gas, although it does plan two more in, in other areas of the country um, later in the year. But really, the uh, the activity that's taking place there already in terms of uh, exploration is is really what's been of real interest and I think has the potential to, to certainly drive more investment. Um, Chevron made a, a, a three and a half trillion cubic foot discovery uh, offshore there earlier this year. Uh, and, and there are a number of wells planned um, for, for the Mediterranean in the coming year. Um, if there are more of these high potential discoveries, then that could certainly drive greater investment. Um, but, you know, the, the crisis itself hasn't necessarily been enough uh, to, to just automatically, you know, have, have companies pouring in. Um, you know, in, in terms of actual output, it's sort of too soon to, to say what's, what's been accomplished, partially because it just it does take a lot of time and investment to, to raise production. Um, but there are also obstacles as well. Um, you know, Egyptian gas output actually declined a bit this year, partially due to a, a production cap at the, the key uh, Zohar offshore field, um, but also uh, Cairo had to implement demand management measures um, over the summer to to sustain LNG exports and limit domestic gas consumption. That also included uh, ramping up liquids burn in its power sector, sector uh, use of uh, greater use of things like diesel fuel. Um, these are things that kind of hurt some of the investor confidence in the local sector. Um, and, you know, despite some of the laws and, and, and terms on offer improving, in addition to this crisis that you've seen in Europe, um, those are two very powerful factors, uh, but they're, they're not necessarily enough to drive a total turnaround in, in upstream investment. Coming up next, a region-by-region -region analysis of the latest trends in sub-Saharan Africa's power generation industry. More on this in just a moment. Imagine a future where tomorrow's solutions build a world of opportunities for all and where human potential is truly realized. Where every child has an equal chance in life, no matter where they were born. 
Imagine the potential of a continent built on low carbon oil and natural gas and abundant renewable energy. Imagine Mozambique, Angola, Nigeria, Uganda, Senegal, Egypt, Namibia and Algeria being let free to develop their natural resources without pressure from wealthy countries to leave it in the ground. Imagine an Africa where we cut red tape bureaucracy and provide better fiscal terms so we can compete globally for energy investments. African Energy Week is the African Energy Chamber's annual event held at the Cape Town waterfront, uniting African energy leaders, global investors and executives from across the public and private sector for four days of intense dialogue on the future of the African energy industry. Showcasing the latest technologies and innovations to 5,000 plus registered delegates from over 100 countries and international professionals from across the global energy sector. Be part of the future of the energy industry and join the energy movement by becoming an official sponsor, exhibitor, delegate or partner. African Energy Week. research firm African Energy has released its live data on the latest trends and opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa's power generation industry, including what to expect in the pipeline between 2023 and 2027. According to AJ Ubi, head of data at African Energy, at least 49 gigawatts of additional capacity expected across sub-Saharan Africa in the next five years, with East Africa leading the way with 14.7 gigawatts, followed by Southern Africa, West Africa, and Central Africa. Take a listen. Now, if we look at um, Southern Africa in the whole as a, as a, as a wider region um, and, and drill a little bit more down into the uh, into the store capacity in the pipeline we expect to see there, despite some of the uncertainties and the delays that I already mentioned in, in South Africa around the procurement, the region is still expected to see some 23.4 gigawatts of additional capacity by 2027. Again, most notable is the amount of hydropower due on due online. Um, the Toka Gorge North and South, which has a combined capacity of 2.4 gigawatts spread across the, the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe and Zambia, is due online between 27, 2027 and 2029. We could also come online as early as 2026, according to the Zambezi uh, River Authority. Understandably, coal is expected to continue to dominate the region for uh, foreseeable future. However, South Africa has talked about repowering and repurposing its coal fleet for, for a few years now. And uh, in the last COP, in the last UN climate conference particularly, there was a lot of discussion and the, the setup of these um, just energy transition partnerships, particularly in South Africa. And there could be some repurposing of its coal fleet. And there's some, some, some quite big things happening in, in East Africa. We're, we're expecting the, the pipeline to see around 15 gigawatts of additional capacity by 2027. And nowhere is the growth in hydropower more prominent than in East Africa. East Africa, along with uh, Central Africa, they're the only two regions in Sub-Saharan Africa where hydropower actually outweighs fossil fuel-based generation. And so this generation, this fossil fuel based generation doesn't play a huge role um, in the pipeline to 2027. Unless there are a number of, of coal and gas projects in the pipeline, but for, for a number of reasons, those are stalled and um, development doesn't seem to be, seem to be continuing with those. So it remains to be seen just how, how um, the pipeline will look in terms of fossil fuel generation uh, in that respect. Private investment across West Africa is going to actually be financing around 4.3 gigawatts of the pipeline up to 2027, compared to 3.2 gigawatts um, financed by by governments. The the larger projects will be the larger private projects will be centered around the the major economies in the region: Nigeria, uh, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and Senegal. Of this 4.3 gigawatts of privately developed capacity. 2.6 will be from natural gas and liquid fuel generation. 
while 1.7 gigawatts will come from renewables uh, in terms of private finance. Of the 3.2 gigawatts publicly financed, um, 2 gigawatts will be renewable. 1.6 will 1.6 of this will be from hydropower, and um, the remaining 1.2 will come from natural gas and liquid fuels. So we're seeing an interesting situation where the governments across West Africa are looking to large-scale hydro projects as opposed to large-scale gas projects, um, in at least in the in the identified uh, pipeline that we can see. Now, again, there are plans, particularly in, in Nigeria and Senegal, for example, where there are um, quite interesting gas to power plans. And at least in Nigeria, there is a, a heavy emphasis on, on gas to power um, going forward up to 2030. So growth in Central Africa has actually been fairly, fairly remarkable. Again, hydropower once again shows its importance across the region, um, primarily uh, in the pipeline, the 420 megawatt Nashtigal hydropower in, in Cameroon which will be the second largest project when it's completed in 2024 after the, the massive Grand Inga development. This, this breakdown of, of, of the energy mix is expected to remain broad, broadly similar in the coming years, um, although non-renewable, sorry, non-hydro renewable projects such as solar and wind are starting to gain more traction after almost a decade of making fairly progress um, you can see from the graph, it was really only up until 2021, 2022, when solar and wind, uh, well, solar in particular, began um, increased development. Um, and so particularly solar capacity is going to expect it to increase uh, in the pipeline going from 122 megawatts at the end of 2022 to 520 megawatts by 2027, as some of the larger schemes come online across the region. And finally, the African Energy Chamber's Invest in African Energy Forum Roadshow is heading to Paris on the 1st of June as it looks to build on the existing Africa-Europe relations to ushering a new era of energy-related growth and prosperity. Discussions in France will be centered on financing African energy projects, developing liquefied natural gas for both African and European markets, and the role that renewable energy and green hydrogen will continue to play in industrializing and electrifying. Africa. You can go online and register to participate at the upcoming Paris Energy Forum event. And that's how we wrap up the show for you this week and we thank you for joining in everyone. Remember to follow Energy Frontiers on Frontier Africa Reports website, subscribe to our YouTube and follow us across all our social media handles as indicated on the screen. It's goodbye from me Justina Okechuko. I'll see you next time.